Australia, the ASX 200 is down 2%. That's a fall of 101 um, points. Well, it looks like, uh, thank you very much for, for listening this week. We've had a lot to talk about. We'll be back on Monday morning at 8 a.m. In the meantime, have a great weekend. The weather forecast for today is going to be mainly cloudy, bright periods during the day with a maximum temperature of around 21 degrees, one or two rain patches tonight. And there's going to be some moderate to fresh northeasterly winds, which will strengthen later. It's the outlook is rainy with temperatures falling further to 15 degrees or below over the weekend. And that temperature right now is 19 degrees centigrade, 74% relative humidity. It's time for the Half Hour News with Samantha Butler. The authorities in California say the arsenal of weaponry found at the home of the couple who killed 14 people in San Bernardino shows they had a mission. The San Bernardino police chief, Jared Bergowan, said the pair, later shot dead by police, were very heavily armed. David Bowditch is a spokesman for the FBI. If you look at the amount of obvious pre-planning that went in, the amount of armaments that he had, the, the weapons and the, the ammunition, uh, there was obviously a mission here. We know that. Uh, we do not know why. We don't know if this was a this was the intended target or if there was something that triggered him to do this immediately. A South African appeals court has overturned Oscar Pistorius's manslaughter verdict and found him guilty of murdering girlfriend Reva Steenkamp. He now faces a possible 15 years in jail when a new sentence is handed down early next year. In his trial, he claimed he shot his girlfriend through a bathroom door after mistaking her for an intruder. But appeals court judge Justice Eric Leach says he should have known someone could have been killed. The possibility of the death of the person behind the door was clearly an obvious result. And in firing not one, but four shots, such a result became even more likely. But that is exactly what the accused did. Cathay Pacific has announced pay rises for staff based in Hong Kong of between 37 and 4%, as well as a 13th month bonus. It's less than the 6% the Flight Attendants Union has been demanding, but the union says the total package is acceptable. The union's chairwoman, Dora Lai, says they've now dropped their plans for industrial action. We, we wouldn't consider it because uh, uh, we really want to grow with um, Cathay Pacific, and we do see, uh, we do see the sincerity to uh, to a certain extent during this um, negotiation, and we do appreciate the effort that both parties put in. So we want to ensure to the public that uh, nothing would happen um, during the Christmas or even Chinese New Year, and we wish um, it, it will continue that way in the future as well. The American Defense Secretary Ash Carter has announced that all U.S. military combat jobs are to be open to women. Mr. Carter said the United States Armed Services could no longer afford to cut themselves off from half the country's talent and skills. He said women would now be able to drive tanks, fire mortars and lead infantry soldiers into combat. You're listening to the news on RTHK. Good morning. Welcome to Back Chat. I'm Hugh Chivert and your co-host today is Danny Gittings. Danny, good morning to you. Good morning. We're talking mostly today about the state of the judiciary in Hong Kong. Former permanent judge of the Court of Final Appeal, Dennis Litton, in a speech this week strongly criticised the operation of our legal system for its obscurity, irrelevance and lack of discipline. Judicial reviews are being abused by applicants and by judges, he claims, wasting time and money. Judgments are long-winded and opaque to most Chinese speakers. Precedents from unlikely countries are being dragged in to needlessly complicate simple issues. There's grandstanding and rhetoric blocking the proper operation of justice. Do you agree? Will the common law have a future after 2047 at this rate? Email us with your thoughts and comments. Our address is backchat at rthk.hk. You can go to our Facebook page, which is back chat on RTHK Radio 3 and comment there or just call us 233-88266 is the number later in the programme would good Samaritan laws cut down waste by allowing charities more leeway in distributing unwanted food and we're also going to be hearing more from Operation Santa Claus 
Welcome to our first topic. We have uh, in our central studio Phyllis Kwong, who's a practicing solicitor and president of the Asia Pacific Law Association, Mark Daly, who's an international human rights lawyer, and uh, joining us on the line is Lawrence Ma, who's a barrister and chairman of the China Australia Legal Exchange Foundation. And uh, we hope to be hearing also from uh, Priscilla Lang, uh, legislator, also later in the program, is also a legal uh, academic associate professor in the School of Law at City University of Hong Kong. And Danny, you are a uh, <laughs> Assistant professor, is that right? Associate professor at Hong Kong U Space. Okay. Um, Mark Daly, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Now, um, I'm not sure whether you actually um, heard Henry Litton's speech or maybe you just just read the press reports. I just read the press reports. Uh, I wasn't invited. I didn't know about the speech. I would have would have gone to it. I was a little disappointed. But yeah. Well, I, I would say I would say it's on the internet. If anyone's interested, I wasn't invited. Either. It's, it's terrible oversight. But it, 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 you can see the whole. You can hear the audio, or you can watch the whole thing on the internet as well. Now, as Hugh said in the introduction, he has some pretty strident things to say about uh, judicial review cases in Hong Kong. Uh, the courts have been misused to challenge government policy. All these um, um, precedents have been cited from obscure Commonwealth countries and the courts have been um, ba- basically far too accommodating to applicants like, like yourself. I mean, you've probably brought some of the cases he criticised. Um, uh, I don't think so, no. I don't, don't think uh, mine weren't on his hit list. Um, uh, well, if you give him a bit more time, I'm sure he'd get to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, very very uh, interesting comments. I think probably a little bit inflammatory, but uh, at the FCC, in order to get a lot of media hits, I think sometimes that's what you have to do. I think there, I, I agree with some of the things he said. Which, which ones do you agree with? Um, I agree. Uh, I, I'd like to have, you know, uh, analyze uh, what he was saying a little bit more. I wish I, wish I was there, because when he says uh, it, it perhaps is, is out of touch sometimes with, uh, with what's going on in society, I think, uh, you know, there's some, something, but we're probably coming from different directions on that. Um, with regard to judicial review, I think I probably restrict most of my comments to that, because that's mostly what I do. Um, we see, A, you have to V- put, see what value we put on judicial review as being super important in Hong Kong for the rule of law. And I think you have to start from that basis and still realize that the Hong Kong legal system in Asia is certainly uh, one of the best legal systems in Asia. We have to start start with that. But we can't be uh, complacent about it. From our perspective, um, and certainly the uh, public law practitioners, um, we see over the last, I think there were statistics a couple of years ago showing that the number of applications are on the rise, but the number of cases getting leave uh, is on the decline. For non-lawyers, let's explain, um, leave is the process yep. by which it's the court actually agrees to hear the case, basically. Right, it's, it's, it's like a filtering process. So the number, the, the, it seems like the threshold It's getting more difficult to get a case to a full hearing. Because that's the reverse of his argument. He's saying the courts are too willing to hear these cases, and um, when they do hear them, they spend far too much time on them. Right. So uh, uh, I wish I brought the article along. I think it was um, probably a year or two ago, but it had the statistics there and showing that the number of cases getting leave and certainly uh, is uh, is lower. And certainly that's been our experience. Um, I can tell we've discussed it in the in the public uh, with public law practitioners saying we're not getting any dumber. Uh, we've done this for 20 years, and cases that up till a, up till a couple of years ago would have been slam dunk. Advise your client that this would get leave are not getting leave. So, uh, so I think there needs to be some scrutiny on that. In addition, there there uh, and and. Uh, I'm by nature conspiracy-minded. We we see uh, we see some some judicial techniques to make things more difficult um, to even get to a full hearing. I mean, there's there's uh, there's judgments out there now. Whereas previously, uh, in my 20 years here. Um, the application process for legal aid was considered a legitimate excuse for um, basically you have to wait for that to get legal aid to take the case to court. Now that's being questioned. Um, so, so cases being thrown out what, in my view, the meritorious cases on a technicality on, on delay grounds. Okay, let's bring in, in another of our guests, uh, Lawrence Ma, barrister and chairman of the China Australia Legal Exchange Foundation. Now, am I right, in the past you, you have actually publicly um, expressed concern about um, some of the use of judicial review in Hong Kong? Yes. Um, so I do have... you agree with um, Henry Litton's comments then? 
Well, um, I think the problem really lies with the legal aid uh, uh, council because un under under section four of that ordinance, um, when you apply for legal aid, um, there is a panel to approve and to investigate whether there is a prospect of the application, and and they, those people who assess the applications are practicing lawyers. Now. These lawyers would also get work from legal aid, so that there, there would be, I would foreshadow, a, a, a situation where there might be a conflict of interest. OK, let's just st step back a moment, because you're talking about um, how you think the movie system, system doesn't work in the best way. What, what you presumably mean there is that um, some cases, are, judicial review cases, have been approved for legal aid that you think shouldn't be, and that, that may be yeah. one of the reasons why there's, there's more, more judicial review in the, in the courts. Yes, but one, once it got legal A and it enters the system, there is, as, as Mark has correctly pointed out, there's a leave application, and uh, the court has to deal with the leave application. I mean, in the case of um, Yvonne Leung against the uh, against this, uh, chief executive and the uh, chief secretary of administration, I think it talked about half a year. Do you, think, that to be do you think the legal, as Henry Litton said, that Hong Kong's legal system has been misused by litigants in um, some legal aid cases? He, I mean, he suggested Yvonne Leung was only um, bringing the case so it would look good on her CV. <laughs> well, I, I, I do, because, I mean, as I said, that the chief executive, being put as a putative uh, defendant, um, shouldn't be involved, and, and, the, and the whole reason for, for putting him as a putative, put it, put it defendant, is to um, um, attract public media attention. And, and he also said that um, Hong Kong courts were, cit were citing too many um, case precedents from um, obscure countries we've hardly ever heard of in Hong Kong, and he mentioned um, various countries in Africa like Ghana and Lesotho. And so, <laughs> what, what is their relevance to Hong Kong? Would you agree with that, Lawrence? Well, I, I agree because to, to a certain extent, for example, cases like the European, European Court of Justice, those cases would based on their own legislations, which we don't, do not have. Now, the, the, and there's dif different um, uh, social settings to these cases. So if, if you draw reference to those foreign precedents, you have to have a scrutinizing eye um, to take into account that the social situation is different. OK, uh, Phyllis Kwong, good morning to you. Thanks, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Do you agree with Henry Litton that the judicial review process is being abused? Uh, well, to a certain extent, he, um, uh, Mr. Litton actually quoted a few cases, uh, but we say that this, these are just a few cases out of, you know, thousands of cases. So, um, you know, uh, and what uh, uh, Mr. Litton Criticize is not the judicial system itself, the judicial review system itself, but the abuse or misuse. But he said the judges are it's allowing the judges. this to happen. I mean, he criticised some of the applicants who are using it in some way, but he said the judges are allowing this to happen, they should have dismissed cases more quickly, and they should have written shorter judgments. Well, I, I, would, I, I wouldn't, I think, um, I wouldn't go into uh, particular cases, but we, if we go to the, the very basic... Um, uh, criteria or uh, for for a, a judicial review application, you know, um, uh, the the threshold really is is higher. You know, there are only three grounds that uh, there are, that can be uh, subject to judicial review. First of all, is it warrant or uh, excess of jurisdiction? Uh, secondly, is it procedural impropriety? And thirdly, it is unreasonableness. You know, unreasonableness is uh, unreasonableness is a is a lawyer. Jargon. Um, yes, so it, what does it, does, that it mean? doesn't mean the same, does it? In legal languages, it no, doesn't no. Language. And and in the context of judicial review, the principle is what we call the Wensbury principle, which is which casts a very uh, rather high um, um, standard of unreasonable. Uh, okay, unreasonable. I think we have to be very careful here yeah. about going into the detail yes. of judicial review. But what uh, the basic point I think you're trying to make is yeah. that um, it is already quite hard, quite difficult to succeed in a judicial yes, review. Yes, the case. threshold is high. Yes, yeah. and 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 of course we have in our system, um, you know, the application for leave um, uh, process, which is um, um, a safeguard. So it sounds what, like you what, don't really agree with Henry Litton. I mean, you're saying it's actually quite difficult to win a judicial review case. 
place already. Oh, um, but that, but I'm, I'm, for, glad Phyllis, those, I'm glad Phyllis agrees with me. I, well, I, let, I agree, let's have, let's well, I agree with, with Judge Lytton <laughs> in the sense that, you know, um, uh, the judge, you know, it is at, at the end of the day, it is, it is common sense. And, and by common sense, uh, those few cases that he actually quoted could have been dismissed summarily rather than, you know, um, you know, spending days and paragraphs. You know, the judgment of uh, Yvonne Leung uh, runs to 26 pages and 63 paragraphs, um, yeah, uh, which could be, you know, could have been one page yes. and say, you know, this yeah. Miss Amarelli. We're not going to do that. I think that, that's um, Priscilla Leung, a legislator, the Business yeah. and Professional Alliance for Hong Kong and Associate Professor at uh, City University of Hong Kong. Miss Leung? Yeah. Yeah. I, I personally, I, I, to a large extent, I agree with uh, Mr. Henry Lesson. In fact, uh, at the Legislative Council, uh, for some years, we have been uh, discussing that the legal aid has, um, has been, um, uh, been used in a way that the allocation of resources is not too fair. And the portion of legal aid has been largely allocated to um, judicial review. And um, also the system itself, uh, uh, apparently, uh, uh, seems to be the case that uh, legal aid actually uh, uh, does not have a fair um, um, uh, decision over different kind of cases. For example, I, I, I have been helping different cases like on language discrimination and others. Very difficult to, uh, to be approved. But if you go to like cases in relation to political agenda, uh, it appears to um, a third person that uh, they ha- it's much easier for them to go for the first step. So actually, in the Legislative Council, we repeatedly raised oral requests uh, to ask the Legal Aid Department to, have an, uh, to, to give an improvement of this system that, like, for example, the clients uh, may, not be, uh, may not have the total uh, uh, po- uh, power and determination of who is the lawyer. If you are using public funds, maybe they should follow the public hospital system that um, uh, different lawyers have the fair chance. Uh, to take up the cases, then it would eliminate certain kind of situation that lawyers and law firms and and as a, a and you know legal aid always outsource to a third counsel to say whether they should approve the case. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. witnessed many deserving cases which are not politically related are rejected by legal aid. You're saying so, that uh, legal aid is it, it is too readily granted in some political cases that the um, yes, legal aid demands should be yes. tougher. They, they actually we have been. Dec- criticizing the legal aid system. Uh, but uh, I am so happy that Mr. Henry Lytton has uh, given a very fair remark, which actually, you know, is very sensitive in, in, the, in the legal, in the circle, in the community of, uh, of law, because, you know, most are practitioners and, and people, if they criticize the legal aid, maybe the legal aid, you know, is just um, very involved in the system. Okay, he didn't, he didn't, is a, is a very good, um, he didn't talk but about legal me, aid. He didn't, me. he didn't mention legal aid, actually. I know, I know. So <laughs> let, let me go on, okay? Like, for example, he quoted, um, uh, you know, these cases did, would not easily go up for judicial review if they are not getting the legal aid. That is a matter of uh, reality. Okay, let, but let, let me let me let me comment some of the cases he said. You know, for example, the cases he mentioned, uh, like Yvonne Leung, and also I raise another case here, like for example, the case on filibuster. You know, if you study the common law principles across the jurisdiction, in fact, the case really has no case, and and at the end, the lawyer raised the case from Israel uh, for for filibuster for Leung Kong Hong. And, 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 and the court also said, well, what's the application of this Israel case? Uh, Hong Kong is talking about common law, doctrine of common law, right? So, um, you know, they try to build up the cases in order to attract public attention. Some of them, some of the cases should be handled in the legislative council. But because they raise it to the court, the court has to play the role to make political decisions. So the court become controversial and different parties 
different people go to protest against the court. Priscilla, let me Which ask is... you something about something else that Henry Lytton said, because you've just raised um, the, the Israel case being cited in uh, the Lung Kwok Hong case. Um, Henry Lytton also said that Hong Kong judges are citing, in, in other cases, too many um, precedents from overseas and that um, uh, they shouldn't be citing cases from these African countries, even though they're common law jurisdictions as well. He said, what are one of these yeah. got to do with Hong Kong? Do you agree? I, uh, you know, all these cases from other jurisdictions, even their common law, they only play persuasive uh, force. That means only for reference. But, but he says they're wasting too much time on them. Do you true, agree? They're wasting uh, too much time. Hong Kong like to refer to other jurisdictions uh, for common law cases. I personally think uh, the Hong Kong court cases, in particular, basic law is a very unique law. So basic law plays a role on the one country, two system. We, are, we should build up our own precedent, but we may not have enough precedent. Uh, if the, the cases are too far and too remote, like Israel and, and some African cases, I think um, um, Henry Litton has uh, I, I called for good uh, attention, called for call attention from the public as well as from the court, that maybe when they consider other uh, common law precedents, uh, which only play persuasive courses, uh, they may um, they may uh, uh, give a note. You know, Hong Kong court also uh, we we love to call uh, um, uh, the uh, UK cases because we are we are much closer to the uh, UK uh, uh, president and others. But um, for African cases, I think uh, it, it depends on the relevance and, 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 and the case. Um, and the point in the case, you know, Mark Daly. So, you know, you you question about the the relevance of uh, of the, uh, of, the of these uh, cases to to Hong Kong. But another general point that was made by uh, Henry Litton um, was about the, uh, the 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 general uh, uh, what was I going to say about, about the uh, about the uh, applicability of um, uh, cases like this. Um, uh, you're talking, you're yes. whether, whether they are yeah. That's true. When, you when, know, yeah. Yeah, applicability sorry. of other common law jurisdictions the courts may refer to, and, and yeah. it's quite... That's true. Well, I think, so Hong Kong like to refer to other jurisdictions. Okay, yeah. Let's come in on this yeah. point as well. On, on the uh, yeah. use of precedents from other jurisdictions, I mean, I think you, ha you have to trust the, uh, the judge to a large extent and the experience of the judge in being able to decide whether... Uh, such and such a case is relevant or not. If, if uh, the point that uh, I, I don't know exactly what uh, Justice Lytton uh, said on, on that He referred to precedents from Ghana, Lesotho, okay. I think Swaziland right. as well. So, so again, you have to look at the, uh, you know, is, is the system uh, similar to uh, Hong Kong? I mean, Israel uh, from, from, I think we have quoted, uh, used an Israel decision one time, but it's a respected common law jurisdiction, actually. Uh, sometimes the judgments are in Hebrew and they're hard to get translated uh, um, but Never knew that. Um, so so you know that's that's a separate uh, topic on which jurisdictions you can legitimately use uh, and which ones you can't time wasting I agree there's some some uh, truth to that I think uh, I think certainly hearings can be much shorter one of the one of the other hurdles that we see in judicial review is uh, again a complete change from about two years ago um, uh, myself with other experienced practitioners in this area would routinely simply upon filing the papers leave would be granted you'd get what's called a CALL1 form either granted or not and and that would be it. Rarely would you have a leave hearing. I, I can't even remember up until but, two years I mean, ago. As you say, how, uh, it's now, routine. Now, as you say, no, no, it's listen, listen just for a sec. Routinely, routinely now, the judges invite the respondent in, either leave or pre-leave to to uh, file evidence, file submissions, and there's a big battle at the filtering stage, then that takes that clutters things up, and, and often okay, out of that we get bit, leave, and then we go to a hearing. All right, but so, it's a bit so of a giveaway when you hearings. talk about routine, yeah. because yeah. this shouldn't be routine. These, sh these should be exceptional. The point is that they're being abused because they're being used to challenge government policy. People say, we don't like this government decision, we're going to stick in a JR. Whatever it is, we'll stick in a JR. Well, uh, and that's not what JRs are for. 
Well, no. That's what he's... The, and the judiciary yeah. is being dragged into the work of the executive. Oh, ju- judicial review... I think there's... I think what I see is a little bit of a distinction here between what some are calling uh, political JRs and uh, there's, a whole, there's, there's a whole spectrum of judi- judicial reviews that, that hold the government to account for their decision-making. I think let's not, let's not lose sight of the obvious. If, if we have better decision-making, then there would be fewer judicial reviews. If we had more fair decisions, better reasoned decisions, we would have fewer judicial reviews. Most of the judicial reviews we do in the, um, in the refugee area, we see very poor decision-making. If the decision-making was better, then you'd have but less But you know that most reviews. of the judicial reviews fail. Most judicial reviews fail. The government is supported in most of them. Well, I'm not sure there isn't to, so much to, so to, wrong with it. Have have to look, look at a look at a year by year. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I have statistics. I've got those. them in front of me. Yeah, and, oh, and, and, and the majority <laughs> fail. Please, but, so, but, I'd but, like to see them. Yeah, but yeah, okay, yeah. Well, yeah. Phyllis, they're they're available on the internet. But yeah. uh, Phyllis Kwong, I mean, this is yeah. this applies to your injunction as well, doesn't it? And Henry Litton has also been very yeah, critical yes. of of, uh, of dragging the judiciary into what should be political or should be public order things and this is why he was critical of your injunction for exactly the same sin. Well, first and foremost, the court, um, I agree with Justice Litton saying that, you know, uh, the court is not concerned with politics or policy. Um, the court is only concerned about the rights uh, and, and, and the legal principles. And he thought in that your my case, In, in yeah. our case, uh, yes, it is, it is a public order element there. Uh, as we all know, and 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 of course, um, um, uh, the DOJ is the government is is indeed in the position uh, to make the application. Uh, on the other hand, it does not preclude um, uh, my clients, the taxi drivers, to make the application, and we did it. We did make uh, the application, and we did uh, guard it uh, with very reasoned. Uh, uh, um, uh, Reasons, um, I think the the query that Justice Litton uh, make was that why didn't the government take up the case, and uh, and I think it, it it is actually a very good idea that the government take up the case um, so that my clients um, don't need to uh, spend the money in 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 the lawsuit uh, for the public good, and also but then, um, but then and and the point, opponent well, um, which uh, daily well, uh, Mark point, is representing yeah. got legal aid. Okay. That means they are they are fighting the the suit without sure, any sure. any cause. But whereas as my client Tessie drivers doesn't have a lot of means have to uh, make uh, fight the, the lawsuit out of their own means, and which is fair and fair. So, so what he's saying, come. what he's saying, but Henry Litton surely was saying that the judges should have said, we're not going to deal with it. This is not our job. Uh, oh, no, uh, no, as, no, as no, with the no, judicial reviews. no. Uh, it is, it is, it is, uh, it is the, it is their job. But um, the um, the problem is who should be making the application? Who is in the more appropriate situation to make the application? And that is a query uh, Justice Litton made. Uh, Lawrence Ma, I'd be interested to hear your views on this because, um, in a sense, Henry Litton was quite even-handed. He said there are too many political cases, um, some being brought by what you might call the pro-democracy camp, but also um, uh, Phyllis, Phyllis Kwong's case, which is basically a, a political case um, uh, which should, should, should not have been resolved through yeah. the courts. Do you agree with that? Yeah. No, um, no, 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 I didn't say that. I didn't say that. No, I'm not saying you, you say that. It is for the court. It is yeah. who should be making, that's who what, would be in a better position yeah. to make the application. That's what Justice Litton said. I'm interested yes. in uh, Lawrence yes. Mars' views no, on no, Justice the, Litton on that side. Okay. The, the, I mean, I'm a bit wary about uh, Henry's comment on this because, I mean, if, if uh, Phyllis's client is not making the application, the Secretary for Justice for the government should have made the application. The result is the same because the, it will have to go to court and the injunction has to be granted exactly. either way. It is so, a I mean, it, it, it's hard to, to say that, that you, you get, get the court involved in political matters, but, but, but either way, the court has to be involved for the so injunction. So you, you don't it? like it when the court's involved in political matters when it's uh, Democrats bringing in the cases, um, but um, when, it, when it's somebody uh, effectively from the pro-establishment camp is okay. Um, I'm not saying that. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you draw that. But I'm, I'm just saying um, it has to be resolved. Uh, some of that has to be resolved by the court. What I'm saying is legal aid counsel shouldn't be granting um, cases that, that is unmeritorious, just like the Yvonne Leung yes. case. Um, once it's gone to court, what, you can't do nothing about it because the judges handle it. 
um, you can't criticize the judge because the leave is the leave application is there and they can, they have to deal with it but the, the, the point is let, to stop let, it at the legal aid council or to assess it properly at the legal aid council um, Priscilla Lone, we're coming up to the news but if yeah. you want 30 seconds before the news Priscilla yes yes you wanted <laughs> to respond <laughs> Kinds of cases. Yeah, uh, uh, Miss Lung, you have you have twenty they seconds. Of, do, do you want to do it? Um, do you want to hang on after after nine o'clock because we we've, we've okay. got less than a minute okay. uh, right. before then. Okay, we're talking about uh, Jun uh, Justice uh, Henry Litton's uh, comments about the state of law and the state of the judiciary uh, in Hong Kong. If you've got uh, anything to contribute, then uh, drop us a line. Back chat at rthk .hk. Uh, We'll be hearing thoughts from some of the listeners uh, after the news at nine o'clock, uh, as well as uh, talking about the issue of uh, good Samaritan laws and uh, food waste and hearing from Operation Santa Claus. Uh, we'll be hearing from what the Chung Hock uh, Elderly Centre plan to do with the money raised by you in this year's campaign. The forecast before that, mainly cloudy bright periods during the day, maximum temperature 21 degrees. One or two rain patches tonight, moderate to fresh northeasterly winds. The readings at the moment 19 Celsius with a relative humidity now at 73%. Back in three minutes. Intelligence agency, which in any case shouldn't have gone public. A government spokesman said Saudi Arabia remained an important partner in a crisis-ridden world. You're listening to the news on RTHK. Welcome back. This is Back Chat on a Friday morning with Danny Gittings and me, Hugh Chiverton, as your host. We're continuing our discussion of the uh, speech given by the former judge Henry Litton this week to the uh, FCC on the state of law in Hong Kong. He's particularly critical of the uh, operation of judicial reviews uh, in Hong Kong, uh, as well as uh, other issues, uh, including um, the uh, judgments that were being given. He said they were long-winded. He said they wouldn't translate properly into uh, Chinese. He was concerned about the future of the common law after 2047 as well. Do you agree? Then uh, drop us a line, backchat at rthk.hk. Uh, you can go to our Facebook page as well, which is backchat on rthk radio 3. Later in the programme, we're also going to be hearing about some suggestions of Good Samaritan laws to cut down waste by allowing more charities, more legal leeway uh, in distributing unwanted food. What's the point of that? And we also will be hearing from Operation Santa Claus. Some comment from our Facebook page. Oh, we should mention our guests uh, this morning. Uh, Priscilla Lung, uh, legislator with the Business and Professionals Alliance for Hong Kong, associate Professor in the School of Law at City University. Uh, Lawrence Ma, who's a barrister, Chairman of the China Australia Legal Exchange Foundation. Mark Daly, an international human rights lawyer. And Phyllis Kwong, a practicing solicitor, President of the Asia Pacific Law Association. On our Facebook page, TC says, of course, the legal system can be used to challenge government policy. A 2013 uh, court case that made one way permit holders eligible to apply for CSSA is a great example of that. I believe things must be very desperate when Hong Kongers have to resort to using the courts to settle political disputes. I would also like to state that it's the right of Hong Kongers to have access to legal recourse. It's the court's decision on whether to take up the case. More importantly, uh, maybe part of Justice Liston's statement shows that a Western-style legal system isn't compatible with a predominantly ethnic Chinese society like Hong Kong. Rod says, why do we keep trying to codify the law when the fairest and best legal systems were based on precedent setting like the decentralised common law? It's fair, flexible, it's competitive. Uh, says uh, Rod. And uh, Henry says, Dennis Litton is highly respectable in his, conf in his profession and his criticism hits the nail on the head. JR has been abused by opposition groups to make things difficult for the government. The claims are petty, irrelevant, with a case well known before submission of the claim. The end result is Hong Kong as a whole suffer in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. Time delay and increased cost and, and business build the likely cost of JR into their costing equation. This is not the core value of Hong Kong, which is the opposite, which the opposition claims they they try to protect. It's interesting to note that they don't now use senile women to submit the claim, as was the case in the Hong Kong Macau Juhai Bridge JR claim. That's the view of uh, Henry on our Facebook page. Thank you very much. Uh, Priscilla Lung, we cut you off before the news. You wanted to come back on the, the use of the courts in political cases, and I think the, in particular the injunctions that um, ended the Occupy uh, protest last <laughs> year. Uh, Priscilla yeah, Lung? I think yeah, let us uh, uh, compare the two like, two groups of cases. One is a uh, judicial review. That mainly, if for uh, before the handover, most of the cases are uh, mainly dealing with uh, the procedure we call unlawful procedure. We're not talking about whether the decision is fair or not politically, whether it's fair. 
but uh, uh, that is the perspective that when uh, those judicial review cases uh, have been launched out of their uh, political uh, uh, unhappiness, okay? Uh, whereas uh, for the injunction for Occupy Central, I also hold the view that um, to apply for injunction for individual cases really, really is not is not a good uh, uh, way to um, to deal with this kind of uh, massive movement. In fact, the government should make a decision either how to clear, how to handle the mass, and then if they are unhappy, they handle the government decision. But uh, uh, obviously, the government did not make a, a decision as such, and leaving those we call victims, that the remaining right they have either uh, it may carry criminal nature or a civil nature, okay? Some are of civil nature, claim. Uh, some are criminal nature. For Criminal cases, uh, no matter how big or small, uh, uh, it is a uh, uh, it is a, a, a very clear cut line that is uh, the cases must be proven beyond reasonable doubt, and they have a particular process. I think Lawrence will will be more uh, familiar with this uh, criminal cases. So I, I think it's a, it's, it is a, a not good to leave the civilian to um, to solve their own problem. But they, it's much better if the government could make a decision to handle the Occupy Central um, in those months. So but, in uh, a sense, you do agree with Justice Lytton, this was a very curious I, use of the courts. I know you say it large, was because the government didn't act, but it's a curious use of the courts. Yes, to a large extent, because the government should act. And if those demonstrators are unhappy, they, look, maybe they lost the judicial review against the government. So they may or may not have a case. But now they're leaving uh, the civilians to solve the problem. But the civilians have to do it because they are victims. Now, they cannot go out Phyllis Kwong said she was unhappy that um, when she brought the case and um, her clients have to pay, that um, the uh, basically the Occupy protesters on the other side were granted legal aid. Would you share that view? Yes, that, yeah, uh, yes, that is also <laughs> something I said is unfair. You know, middle class in particular are very difficult to apply for legal aid, no matter what kind of nature. And I already point out that. The legal aid has been criticized for years in the, at the Legislative Council. Well, I, oh, I both by oral request or by motion debate, I personally move a motion debate that, you know, middle class could not access the legal aid and they have to pay. Well, uh, if people who, who, who apply legal aid out of political nature, very easy to get the legal aid. So that is something we need to review on the legal aid system. What would you do? What would you do? How would you... Um... I may move Another oral request, I, I have to say, I, we have to thank Mr. Henry Lytton that he actually, he, he, he's willing to give his, uh, his, re, his comment on uh, the existing limitation of the system. And I think it's worthwhile, very worthwhile for everyone to really look into the matter. And sometimes practitioners also have certain limitations because they are practitioners. They have to face the court. And they have to apply for legal aid for their clients. So it, it is really a public forum that the legislative council should discuss. Even um, I, I think it's, it's really fair because public money has been spent. While those discussing cases have not received legal aid, that is what I see. While all other political cases easily get legal aid. Okay. Now, I received a lot of complaints from middle class. Yeah, let's, leave, let's ask Mark Daly, because a lot of his cases are funded by legal aid. This is very dangerous for you, isn't it? To mm. No, no, no. Start I, to get, I, get more difficult to get legal aid for your cases. I, I agree uh, that uh, the middle class, uh, you know, they have difficulty. Uh, and so the legal aid system's not perfect. But That's from what one I, side. How about the, uh, the, about the other side? Uh, were you less like, it's, uh, it's about uh, um, any, legal any, aid being, saying legal it, aid is granted too readily for political well, cases? From, from what I heard earlier that... Uh, that uh, she said that uh, legal aid was difficult to get in many other cases um, and allegedly too easy in political cases. Well, how about that um, side? We don't take a whole lot of uh, what, what uh, from what I hear, these are considered uh, political cases. Um, I, uh, we, we need to define what that means. Um, one of my um, uh, professors back in Canada, I've been here 20 years, uh, Michael Mandel, and Danny would, uh, would know uh, Professor Mandel. title of his book was The Charter of Rights and the Legalization of Politics. And uh, Canada... Canada um, has been used to, for many years, having a system where the government's uh, decisions are challenged based on a charter of rights. 
And so that, by definition, brings many more cases into the courts that, in Hong Kong, from what I'm hearing, they would be considered political cases. Well, wake up. The reality is we have a basic law. We have Bill of Rights ordinance. And I think that... Uh, we that also have separation of powers. Separation of powers <laughs> yeah, is, is yeah. not, is no, not for true. the courts to make government policy. Well, it's true, true. Not, to, you not, 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 to, not to make policy, yeah. but the courts have the power to challenge these things uh, under the basic law and under the uh, rights provisions. So, Some court case, judicial yeah. review cases these days with proportionality come very close to, mm-hmm. to deciding sure. policy, don't sure. they? And so so uh, that's, that's the reality that we deal with. So I think uh, a lot of people... And uh, just hap- happen to be trained in the UK, and and I think a lot haven't come to the reality of our uh, constitutional situation here in Hong Kong. Yeah, okay, that that, that reality uh, is mentioned in uh, some of our uh, email messages. Thank you very much indeed. Backchat at rthk.hk. Jalal says, newsflash, we don't have a democracy. We have an exceptionally dysfunctional punk political system. The only means of challenging our overbearing and rampaging executive is through the courts. Uh, I'd support changes to judicial review as soon as we have democratic means of challenging the government. Agreed. Uh, Priscilla Lung has virtually no experience in judicial review or legal aid. She does not know what she's talking about, (laughs) says Jalal. Okay, uh, uh, somebody who signs himself Oliver Twist says legal aid system is heavily pressured because those in authority and decision makers shy away from their responsibilities to go that extra mile to arrive at reasonable conclusions, uh, thereby pass the buck to a higher authority to make the decision by way of a judicial review, where most of the issues could have been settled and disposed at lower levels. Agreed. Basically, those in authority just pass the buck, not through ignorance, but for their convenience and speedy disposal, says Oliver. Okay, Bowen says this. Dear Backchat, I admire the down-to-earth and pragmatic approach adopted by Henry Lytton in his speech in the FCC. One wonders, however, if he might have attributed the wrong motive to applicants for judicial review when he accused them of grandstanding. Uh, one can take issue with some of their choice of putative respondents for technical reasons, but the raison d'etre for the applications, at least in the case of Yvonne Leung and uh, Kwok Chuk Kin, which Mr Lytton cited with disapproval, seems honourable, to say the least. One has to bear in mind the context in which these applications for judicial reviews were made meaning the ways in which the constitutional reform process itself has been abused and tampered with by the authorities on both sides of the border. The need for discipline when it comes to the law, which Mr Lytton raised several times in his speech, is also one which needs to be observed much more by the executive branch of government on both sides of the border as opposed to the judicial branch on our side. As for his point on the social costs incurred by judicial review applications... It might be more meaningful if the government had done it more thoroughly and competently in managing delays and costs overruns the express rail and other infrastructure projects and successfully resisted the temptation to expend huge public resources on projects like the West Kowloon Cultural District, which are themselves justifiably open to accusations of grandstanding and cost ineffectiveness. Finally, Mr Lytton pointed to the danger of our judiciary sleepwalking towards 2047 in a world of legal niceties, detached from people whose only language is Chinese. If he meant our leaders in Beijing by that, that's something which the people of Hong Kong are already too painfully aware of. Lawrence Marr, we haven't heard from you for a while, and that that, that point about uh, sleepwalking towards 2047 is something we haven't discussed yet. Um, Your thoughts on that? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, but it it seems that um, thinking about Hong Kong being... uh, The development of Hong Kong, the economic development particularly, um, has been quite slack because of all these, uh, some of these uh, uh, judicial decisions that, that has the effect of uh, prolonging possible infrastructure construction projects, uh, which also delays, uh, which also delays uh, uh, economic progress and, and, and less unemployment. Um, and vis-a-vis across the border, we have Shenzhen is now applying to become a city under the direct central government administration. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing the, the thing that Shenzhen is developing economically and civilly so well, um, which Hong Kong would be in 2000, and, which would certainly take over Hong Kong in 2047. Two, 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 now, what would then we have to, to, to have to clinch on to this prow of our legal system, whereas our economic development is so backward? That's, that's just my view. So would you advocate changing the legal system before 2047, Lawrence Mark? Um, not substantially, I would have thought. We have to maintain our legal system here. But how to, uh, 
have a legal system which will not work against um, economic development is the most important issue that we've got to resolve. OK, uh, Priscilla, Priscilla Leung, uh, this uh, comment about Justice Lytton about um, sleepwalking towards 2047, your thoughts? Yeah, I think this is not a, a sex issue like that. China is evolving their legal system. Uh, you, you can see, I actually, I personally involved in a project to publish the China Court Presidents for 20 years. Um, they, are, they, they differ from the common law, but I can see there are... Uh, uh, they, the two kinds of systems are learning from each other. In particular, uh, the Chinese legal uh, community actually has been appreciating common law a lot. So I think those uh, spirits of uh, common law, they already uh, try to adopt uh, uh, some of them or many of them in different kind of uh, court levels. And I, I, of course, we hope that um, two, two legal systems are evolving in such an extent that we keep our good points. Like the, those, uh, the best point of common law uh, will be preserved, and our system may evolve uh, also um, to improve those um, weaknesses or limitations that we have been facing. And, and it's it, it not just like say yes or no and then 2047 was the legal system. Because uh, under one country, two system, the two legal traditions are both evolving. And I believe common law has a lot of strength that actually we, we have caused impact uh, into China. And I, you know, um, I have been also involving in different kind of programs to train the China court judges uh, in, 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 uh, in the um, uh, different kind of uh, education of common law. So it takes some years. I, I think it's still too early to say what would be the legal system in China in 2047, as well as uh, what would be the fix issue for Hong Kong in 2047 so in terms of legal it's, traditions. It's too early, but it sounds to me like you would like to see the common law system survive in some form. Maybe it's evolved, but you'd like to see the common law system survive oh, in some form course, beyond 2047. Uh, common law has a lot of strength. In fact, that is what we have been doing quietly. We try to sell to sell and as well as uh, to advocate the strength of common law uh, to the Chinese legal circle. And uh, many of the young lawyers and uh, uh, the young judges, now they can speak English and they can um, understand the original court documents and court and precedents, even the format of their court uh, decisions, um, uh, have been uh, incorporating many of the ideas of uh, the common law. So we are talking about um, justice. So whichever system is better to, um, to go closer to justice, I believe it would be prevailing. And I think that the common law traditions in Hong Kong has been proven to be a very strong tradition to uphold justice. Of course, we should treasure our own um, own building stones. But um, uh, and I believe um, actually that would be uh, a strength that we can uh, we can keep. Phyllis Kong. Yes, I I think uh, it is a wake up call. Uh, we have, I think we have to, um, the legal sector, including the judiciary, we have a very good system, but it is not perfect. And we have uh, about you know, more than 30 years to improve it and to, uh, to tell the whole world, including those in Beijing, that it is a system uh, that is worth uh, keeping, cherishing. What, what's, what's wrong with it now? Oh, no. oh well, it is... Well, it is. It is. It is. Um, you know, um, it is not perfect. Sure, sure. Like it is costly. Okay. It is low. You know, it is all those uh, criticisms <laughs> of 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 uh, Mr. L uh, of Justice Lytton. Mm. Uh, but it is a good system. It's often said a common law system is actually not very suitable for a bilingual legal system because um, a bilingual legal system, everything should be in both languages. And in practical terms, it's, it's impossible to translate all the court cases into Chinese and indeed vice versa now with more court cases being heard in Chinese and not translated into English. Well, uh, bilingualism is one of the advantages of Hong Kong, um, you know, being, um, you know... Um well, the, uh, CY said the super connector, whatever you know, we we know the Western world and also the Chinese, uh, the China, and and there is a prize for this advantage, and that includes uh, long winding translation uh, of the court cases, the court decisions. 
Mark Daly, your thoughts on uh, Well, I, I certainly still rather be in Hong Kong uh, with the rule of law here. There's not much that I would want to borrow from what I see from the mainland legal system. With regard to uh, economic, economic cases, if we call them that, I'd much rather be in Hong Kong where we have the scrutiny of uh, what's going on with, uh, with um, development here so that we avoid things like the... Um, the safety hazards and the explosions like the city in northern uh, China. I mean, so um, <laughs> that's the downside to uh, not having proper scrutiny on what's going on. So, um, you know, of course, you want to be, uh, we, we have freedom of speech here, and we thank uh, Justice Lytton for his provocative comments so that we can debate these things and continue to fine-tune the system that is uh, that we all uh, value here in Hong Kong. You're, you're being very restrained and moderate this morning, Mark, Mark Daly, right? <laughs> Surely, he, <laughs> don't you worry sometimes when you hear, I mean, you, you welcome free speech, but you worry when you hear these kind of comments that um, you'll move towards a situation where it will be um, very difficult to get legal aid ever to bring cases against the government. Well, uh, it, 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 it's not easy uh, now, is it? It's yeah. not easy now. Like I said, it's um, and the uh, you know the courts are tightening things up. Um, I think that it's uh, it brings the um, legal system into disrepute when you because you've got more cases. If that's the uh, the thesis, because you have more cases to deal with as a judiciary, that somehow then that justifies the merits test being higher, um, what I see on a day-to-day -day basis, what that means to me is client X uh, is more likely to go back to his country and face torture, or such a such a family is going to be separated. I mean, yeah, let's do that if we have the, the judge explain the uh, decision to the family that's going to be aggrieved by his decision. Well, the judiciary, I mean, Hong Kong's come a long way in, from where we were a few years ago in terms of how we handle refugees, haven't we? You must accept that. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. But on that, on the point of uh, waste of resources, um, without, uh, wouldn't be time to go into it. But you know, uh, I think, Danny, you know, the, the number of test cases that we took, which were successful over the last 10 years to lead to the present system, were all, would all be unnecessary if the government after Prabhakar had proactively put this system in place. So that's a perfect example to show that uh, they, the government, by their inaction, they basically left it to the courts to incrementally decide for them to put a proper system in place. If the government had sat down in 2004 and put in a proper system, we would avoid about 15 judicial reviews over the years. We wouldn't have 10,000 asylum seekers here. We'd have 1,000, and we wouldn't have the problem that we have now. L L Lawrence Ma, I mean, you know, you could argue that the government should be welcoming this. Um, um, uh, some, somebody said that uh, leaving aside the inevitable tension and exhaustion, the government uh, has to be and has become more vigilant. These challenges... Uh, help develop a culture on the part of the government uh, to formulate their legislative proposals and policies in compliance with the Constitution and human rights protection. It actually if, makes the government better. If the court slaps them on the wrist on occasion, do you, do you then agree, they would wake up. Do you agree with that, Lawrence Marr? Well, I, I'm thinking, I'm still uh, um, mingle on that point about uh, refugees coming. I think from my experience in Australia, there are still many of the refugees, economic refugees, and out of these... Many economic refugees, only one, uh, only what five percent, are genuine um, political uh, asylum seekers. So I mean, um, I'm not sure how you make of it because it, it seems that um, we 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 do not have that many genuine applicants. Um, over the years. But, uh, and the point Mark Daly was making was they only had to go to court repeatedly because after the first court case, the government essentially failed to respond or responded in the minimum, in the minimum way. And our listener Bowen earlier was making a, a similar point, saying that um, these, these court cases are a, a result of government inaction. If the government was more proactive in responding, you, you, uh, you wouldn't get these judicial review cases. Judicial review is uh, a response to government failures. Uh, and and a way and a, a way to make the, the the government better to improve the standard. Well, I would have thought that they they would they would uh, seek judicial review because it would prolong their stay. Either way, I mean. <laughs> Is that right? I mean, that's a, that's, that, that that's, happens that's in Australia. No, that's the propaganda that the government's putting out now after 10 years of inaction. Yeah, but, but that's actually true because it, it, when they apply for judicial review, ta they've been given time. 
to stay here, and they'd be given the opportunity to probably work. I'm not sure. Um, and then no, they're not finally, not allowed to work. Not allowed to work. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, and then finally, if it got rejected by, say, the Court of Appeal, they got to go back. They got to go back. Phyllis Kwan, what, what what do you think about that point that the judicial reviews are not an op, you know not, not an obstacle to the government? They're a spur to they're, they're a way to improve the government. That that view, by the way, came from the Secretary for Justice, Wang Yan Lung. Well, I, I don't think that judicial review is meant, a system is meant to improve the government. Um, it is, I think it is the legislature's um, a duty uh, to, um, to keep check on government policies. And I, I agree 100% uh, with uh, Justice Lytton's view that the court is not concerned about policy, about politics. He is concerned about law, about, about facts, about evidence about justice. Uh, okay, uh, but uh, I mean, at, at least it would encourage the government, judicial reviews encourage the government to uh, present their policy better. Oh, yes. Um, well, the, the right for the citizens, for the ordinary people to sue the government, it is something that I think all Hong Kong people should, uh, should cherish. Well, did you but it is not for abuse. Surely you agree that uh, sometimes the government, when it acts in matters of policy, can break the law, and that's what the courts are there for. Yes, exactly. If, you know, um, the judiciary, the, the government and the legislature, all, they all have their boundaries, and if they exceed their boundaries, um, it, is, it is for, for, you know, for, the, for, the, for, the, um, for the courts to correct. Um, and Lawrence Ma, you don't want to see judicial review to disappear, presumably. Well, I think the judicial review, if it's taken on uh, regularly, it would really force the government into a more recent decision. Um, they would have to better reason it, their decision out, put it in writing, and justify on judicial review. But as to whether the, it would change the decision, that's, that's another question. Mm. I don't think you can change the policy decision by the court. And that's not decided that way. The judicial review is not designed to change the policy of the, of, of the government. Okay, well, Lawrence Ma, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you to uh, Phyllis Kwong, uh, solicitor, president of the Asia Pacific Law Association, to Mark Daly, an international human rights lawyer, and uh, earlier Priscilla Lung, legislator uh, with the Business and Professionals Alliance and also associate professor in the School of Law at City University. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, finally, today uh, to Operation Santa Claus, our annual fundraising campaign. This year, supporting 22 different charities. Among them is the Chungkok. Elderly Centre, which comes under the Women's Welfare Club, Western District, Hong Kong. Money raised by you will go towards buying a number of smart devices to show the centre's members how technology can improve their lives. Ian Pooler went along to find out more about the project, which is called I Am Smart. My name is Aaron Fong and I'm the social work assistant of Chonghua Elderly Centre. The project name is I Am Smart. So it involves several series of training workshops tra which train the elderly to learn how to use smart device and use their skill to provide service for the centre afterwards. What sort of applications might they want to use on these pieces of equipment? For application, I think the photo editing application. I think they, they would like to learn a lot about this. Also, some kinds of application for checking the stock market. My name is Stella. Well, hearing this project, I would certainly wait to have the opportunity to learn iPad, right? So we're talking about 10 iPads here. So I would certainly wait so that I can participate, hopefully, <laughs> to be one of the learners <laughs> you know, to, to learn using iPads. What kind of thing would you like to do with it? Searching, online searching. Because, you know, even before retirement, you might have in the workplace uh, online activities and so on. Yet after you retire, you may not want to continue on the same pace and the same kind of intensity uh, at the workplace. Yet, you know, perhaps on one day you stop everything. So it's an opportunity to gradually, you know, to start to have the facility and the opportunity to do it bit by bit, after retirement. My name is Philip Chang. I'm also a member of the centre. Now, tell me, what kind of things would you like to learn about, though? What use would you put it to? Maybe on the photo checking and editing, that will be very interesting, create good memories. And maybe on other applications like Facebook, that I can connect with my friends 
and uh, members of the family. Have you always been a keen photographer before with uh, normal cameras? I did, but uh, I think it's more effective and efficient with uh, something like iPad. Yeah, so I'm, I'm longing for that. <laughs> what kind of uh, pictures would you like to take? I think at our age, as uh, we have our grandchild, so most probably we will take many, many pictures with them. And I'm also interested in the scenery uh, photos. I'm Annie Fong, the wife of Philip. So you remember this uh, elderly centre. Now they've got this project which is going to be starting soon. Now, are you quite excited about this? Yes, very excited. You know, it's the modern style outside and I'm using all the the old style, so I'll learn more about that. So I'd love to have the lessons here. So I'd like uh, to 